let's now talk about the language diversity of native Alaskans. That's sort of one way of thinking through, sort of getting a bird's eye view of Alaskan native groups. There are 20 different Alaskan native groups, sorry, 20 different Alaskan native languages. And you can see here. They include such as Alaskan languages as Kuchin, Han, Tanakos, Upper Kanana, Adna, Kanana, Koyukun, Kodakuchuk, Kuskulkun, Sikhinok, Denaina, as well as um, such groups as Iyak, Tengit, um, both of which are sort of related to the Adna group and part of what's called the Nadine language family. Uh, you have Haida and Simshim, which are separate unto themselves, at least within the Alaska context. You have um, Inupiaq, Central Yupik, Siberian Yupik, Unangash, and Alutika Sikpiaq, all of which fall within what's called the Eskimo Alut language family. So, um, again, 20 native languages, which is a lot, and those fall within four different sort of language families, with the Simshian group sort of being unto itself, the Haida group, there's debate about whether it's part of another language family or whether it's what's called a language isolate, which means it's not related to any other languages. Um, Eskimo loot again, covers quite a bit of territory. Oh, I should explain what a language family is. So language family, as the name might suggest, is a group of languages that are descended from a common language. That's actually a little bit simplistic because usually there's more going on than just one language becomes multiple languages kind of mishmash around. Basically, the idea of language family is that you have sort of a mother language, and then languages sort of go branching off of each other over time. Um, a good example of that is the Romance languages in Europe, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romani. Um, they actually sometimes don't sound much alike. Um, sometimes people that speak one can definitely notice similarities, especially in ones like Portuguese and Spanish. Um, but whether or not they sound particularly similar, when you really look at their grammar and vocabulary, they are very, very similar languages. And that makes sense because they are all descended to a great degree from Latin from when that was all part of the Roman Empire. That's the idea of a language family. Um, so Eskimo Lut is another language family. I should mention, since this is the first time we're using the word Eskimo, that that's definitely not a preferred term. Um, in the eyes of many Inupiaq and Yupik people, um, and I would tend to agree, and I don't use that term unless it's specifically in reference to this language family, because this language family was named when that was still a term that was in widespread usage. So linguists were classifying this term many decades ago, and that's why it has that name as part of it. Um, but that language family includes Inupiaq, Yupik, the Yupik groups, the Inayash group, the Supiak group. And then you have the Athabascan groups, um, as well as the Tlinga and the Ayak, Iyak, who together kind of make the Nadine bigger language family. So the Athabascan groups control a huge part of this state traditionally. And by the way, together, the Athabascan native groups um, are control a large portion of the land that's controlled by Alaska native people within the state of Alaska. Um, it's interesting to know, by the way, that there are Athabascan speakers, people that speak languages related to these Alaskan native languages, all the way down in California as well as in the American Southwest. So the Navajo, one of the largest tribes in the United States, um, the Navajo Nation or Diné, who I've worked with, their language is actually related to these um, Athabasca languages up here. Now, I would like for us to, I would like for you to, on your own time, um, watch this video because I tried to show it previously with my screen share slides and it messed up the audio really bad. So. Please watch that video on your own time. I'll provide a link. But it's a video that shows several of the different native, well, really all of the different Alaska native languages being uh, spoken or rather sung. And you'll notice that the languages sound very different from each other. Haida and Simshian, for example. Uh, Haida seems to have more drawn out vowels. Simshian sounds more like things that you're pronouncing with the front part of your mouth, consonant heavy. Um, Tlingit sounds different still, among other things, because there's the use of the aspirated L sound. Um, which is an L through a cross with a cross through it if you're writing it down on paper, but you kind of have to put the tongue, your tongue on the tip of your teeth and breathe through it. So anyways, these languages are very diverse from each other and they're very beautiful.
um, there's something just rich in terms of how it sounds to our ears when you have these 20 different languages. They're also really important for our identity, right? So it's a group of people saying so this is who we are as a people. It's also important for in the sense that um, languages and it they're not just ways to transmit information, but sometimes there's information that can just be transmitted through specific languages, right? It's not as if every concept exists in every language, but instead there's specific concepts in specific languages. For example, the Gish and the Geisha in Denaina, which we'll speak about later, um, which you have these concepts that, yes, you can explain them in English, but they may, they come forward with more richness in their native language, these specific concepts. Um, Inupiaq and many of the other native languages of Alaska are highly polysynthetic, which means that one word can be slightly modified to convey a tremendous amount of information. And that's often used to have really rich descriptions about the environment and about movement of things. And so um, there's aspects of languages that are really cultural, right? They're like kind of sharing a worldview, sharing a way of communicating about reality. And in that regard, language loss is a real concern. And also just because it is so central to identity and to many other things. And as you notice, if you did watch that video, many of these native languages are in trouble in the sense that there are very few native speakers anymore. Now, a native speaker is different than just a speaker. There's potentially a lot more people who can speak parts of the language, definitely. But by native speaker, we mean somebody that really is like highly, highly fluent, and it was probably like raised in it. That's the native speaker, right? Um, 17 out of 28 native Alaska languages are under 300 fluent speakers. So that's problematic from a point of view of trying to keep languages alive. And you know, this really does follow a broader linguistic trend in the world where we expect that of the 6,000 give or take languages in the world, linguists project that at least 50% will go extinct by 2100 unless something drastic changes. Um, here in Kenai Peninsula College, as well as UA more broadly, as well as UAF, uh, we're doing a lot of work to try to sort of, and I'm sure UAS as well, I've just not been here in this state long enough to know what um, Juno's up to with that. But the colleges here are really making an effort to try to chip, try to um, contribute to efforts of language revitalization. And so, for example, here on KBZ campus, you have a number of native language courses, including in Denina, Atna, and I believe there's also UPIC courses here. Down at Kodiak, I think they do LOT classes. Um, so there's these efforts very serious efforts at the college level, as well as in these local communities to revitalize the language. And I think those are making really good steps in the right direction um, because language loss is really a serious concern. Language, by the way, um, is kind of a reasonable um, proxy for culture in the sense that a shared way of communicating doesn't always go with a shared way of making a living and a shared religion and a shared way of making houses and all of that, but it often does. It often does. And so when we say there's 20 language, native languages in Alaska, it's uh, we could also just as reasonably say that there's 20 um, Alaska native distinct cultures, the Naina culture, Adna culture, Tanana culture, Inupai culture. These cultures, of course, um, though, do have similarities to each other sometimes, and you can kind of group them into bigger culture group regions, um, which more or less correlate to the languages. So Williams suggests eight. She says, you know, the Inupiaq cultures, Athabascan cultures, Yupik slash Cupic slash Yupiaq cultures, um, the Onangan or Alut, the Sukpiak or Alutik. Um, you have the Southeast region, Williams splits off Iyak as its own culture. We have them with Tengit, Kostinit, Haida, and Sinshi. They actually speak three very different languages, but there's a lot of cultural similarities there in terms of these societies that have moieties, which is a type of kinship, um, certain types of ranking, certain types of settlements. So a lot of similarities despite having different languages. So if we take a group like Athabaskan and say, well, that's a cultural group, we're not saying that Tanaina, Adna, Gwich'in, are the same, definitely differences there. What we're seeing though is that there's some kind of broad similarities there. Again, every language group, every tribe, even every village, you go to different in your pack villages and they have different ways of adapting to very specific environments. There's gonna be those differences, but it's helpful to kind of have a roadmap of the territory. And in that regard, knowing that there's kind of about eight major cultural differences 
the cultural groups. And if you look at the syllabus, you'll, it'll kind of make sense now why I did things the way I did and why I kind of divided the modules the way I did. Other than um, a couple of exceptions, mainly Denina, for all the other modules, what I've got is I basically got a major cultural group for each module. I decided to split Denina off by itself, um, even though it's part of the Athabascan group, because it's so significant, I think, for people that live on Denina lands to learn about Denina. And also because there's some specific things I wanted to talk about in that module. All right, let's now talk about populations, villages, and corporations as another way of thinking about Alaska Native groups and kind of getting a bird's eye view. So as far as population, Alaska Native population has quadrupled in the last, in over 45 or so years from 1960 to 2013, went from 40,000 to over 150,000. That matches the population growth of the state as a whole. Um, the state as a whole more or less quadrupled in population. So that tells us that Alaska Native groups aren't necessarily growing any faster than anybody else, or at least the state as a whole. But at the same time, they're also not like disappearing minority or something like that. No, Alaska Native people are a significant percentage of the state and will remain so, may even increase in percentage. Um, right now, they're at least 15% of the states, and some estimates put it even higher, 18 or even 24%. Um, how are, what kind of government governance is involved in that population? So um, Alaska Native people are US citizens, obviously. Alaska Native people are state of Alaska residents, obviously. In addition to that, Alaska Native people in some cases are part of what are called regional corporations. Um, and these are similar in many ways to the way tribes operate in the lower 48. They are federally recognized tribal entities. Um, at this, with you know ways of tracking who's a member, um, with certain ways of uh, providing programs for their members, but it's different in the sense that it grows out of a law called INCSA of 1971. We'll talk more about it next week, but essentially, um, to oversimplify, the state of Alaska had taken certain portions of land that were occupied by Native people, um, and this was long after sort of Europeans had moved into the area. There were areas that were like kind of the status quo is accepted after colonialism, as well these are native villages and communities. And then some of those lands had been taken by the state of Alaska when it was becoming a state um, and sort of taking out land from the public domain. And so that led to um, advocacy, act activism, and um, legal efforts by Alaska native people, which eventually led to a settlement agreement with the state of Alaska that was then sort of formalized through INSA. This law passed by the US Congress. And part of what happened was that there was 13 regional corporations set up, 12 that cover different regions of the state and one that covers Alaska Native people living outside of the state that were party to this law. And basically about 50 million acres of the land that had been improperly taken or given back to were allowed to go back into the hands of Alaska Native groups, um, very specific lands. And then also there was a major cash settlement as a result of this close to a billion dollars, which Sounds like a lot, but also please bear in mind that that was 40 years ago and that there was um, thousands of people then and thousands more now. Um, so it's not as if this was like some sort of boon of un mm, unexhaustible wealth or something like this, but it allowed for the corporations to get going. And instead of the law set up 13 regional corporations that um, they are corporations, right? So they're there to provide services for Alaska and Native tribal members, certainly, and most of them have some kind of um, sort of nonprofit arm, and they do things like cultural programs, they do things like educational programs, um, you know, and they do things like um, health clinics and things like that. You've probably seen um, Alaska Native tribal run clinics around. Um, so the regional corporations are very important in that way. At the same time, they operate like a corporation in the sense that part of their goal and part of their mission, and the way it was established by law, is that they're supposed to turn a profit or the Alaska Native people that have shares in these organizations. And so they might be involved in things like allowing logging on some of their lands, allowing real estate development on some of their lands, allowing tourism on some of their lands. And so this then, in some cases, does not provide a profit um, or not much of a profit. In other cases, some of the corporations are um, making a reasonable profit off of this. And so not all Alaska Native people, but a lot of, or some Alaska Native people have shares in these Native corporations and therefore receive 
uh, some of the profit that results from these different projects. Um, and you know, when I was teaching in the lower 48, that kind of a concept is a little bit difficult to explain. Um, I don't think it should actually be that difficult to explain in Alaska because um, it's not entirely dissimilar from PFD in the sense that people that are members of a community that has control over a resource then receive a small portion of the economic benefit from using that resource, right? Um, but in this case, they're actually shareholders in these corporations. You also have the Alaska Native Villages, and there's about 200 different Alaska Native Villages. Um, that's about 50% of the federally recognized tribal entities. So that's a significant portion. Um, they are, again, federally recognized tribal entities. They're sort of under the regional corporations. You've got these 13 regional corporations. By the way, Anchorage is in Cook Inlet Regional Incorporated Region. But then you have these smaller village corporations, which are more or less one, you know, a village corporation for each of these Alaska Native villages. There are exceptions. It's, for example, you might have two or three Alaska Native villages that have one corporation between them. But for sake of argument, you basically have a na Native Alaska village and a Native Alaska village corporation that helps provide services to and manage lands around um, that are sort of related to that Alaska Native village. Um, these groups administer land, funding, and other programs. There are also tribes uh, such as the Kenansi tribe, which don't necessarily have the word village in their tribal entity name. But the Alaska Native villages um, are very, very interesting. There's really nothing to kind of compare them to in the lower 48 as these kind of small, small, very, very rural, often very, very isolated um, tribal communities that sort of operate unto themselves as um, village corporations. What's although they're also again under these regional corporations. Another thing that makes that interesting is that not only is the Alaska Native population, I believe, the highest, I believe Alaska has the highest percentage of people with Native ancestry at 15% or more. They also have, with the Alaska Native villages, you'll note on this map, those Alaska Native villages are really spread all over the state. So I some areas have more Alaska Native villages than others, but they're really spread all over the state. And that's significant in the sense that it's not like places like Arizona, where there's a lot of Native Americans within Arizona, but the reservations tend to be concentrated into like sort of one third of the state or one part of the state. Um, the Alaska Native villages are very different. They're interspersed throughout the entire state, which I think makes for very different dynamics. Among other dynamics, the fact that, um, it, yeah, just a lot of different um, ways that the politics and economics and cultural interactions work as a result of the fact that Alaska Native villages are interspersed with the other communities. At the same time, we don't want to overemphasize how important the villages are. So people will sometimes be like, oh, you know, I'm, I might go work in the villages, the Alaska Native villages, so I want to take this class, which I think is a really good reason to take this class and a totally awesome motivation. At the same time, um, it's useful to remember that actually almost as many Alaska Native people live in the cities as the villages. So it was 40% a few years ago. It's increasing, so I imagine it's a little larger now. This is a map of Anchorage, and you see that there's regions in Randall where over 12% of the population is Alaska Native or otherwise Native American. 